Well, Desiree, thanks so much for taking some time to hang with me today. I appreciate it. Of course. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. So when I um, look at pop linen, you know, or any clothing line, one of the first things that I always think to myself is what did the founder believe was missing in the marketplace? Like, why did they start this? Was it just like a cool idea or was there actually something missing where it was like, no, 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 consumers need this. What, what was it for you? Cool idea or something missing? You know, it, I, I find it's a little bit of this hybrid for me. I thought cool idea. I love the idea of really trying to disrupt a little bit. I know that word's used a lot, but just kind of try something different with clothing and and, in the sense of sustainability and really kind of sharing this message around an inclusive brand that really wants to strive to make women feel more than not less than, I mean, I love fashion. I love clothing. I love having my own style. And there's definitely brands that I've really enjoyed for like one particular thing. And I, I kind of just saw a few brands and thought if I could just like pull all of these together, this would be the perfect brand to me. And really focusing on one, you know, higher quality fabrics that are super, you know, durable, but also natural, biodegradable, um, premium in that they would last longer, um, better for your skin. And then also I um, had thought about just wanting to have this brand be more inclusive to women, you know, by offering extended sizing and really sharing in our marketing um, a picture that all women could feel connected to, you know, making sure we were diverse in the way we shared our message, making sure that we were sensitive towards different women's needs, making sure our product actually, you know, would fit well and complement, you know, women of different, you know, size and shapes. So those are all things that really mattered to me and just having that traceability of knowing where it's made um, you know, putting the values and the ethics of it and also, you know, in the actual impact we were having on the planet. So um, those things I felt like were the the things that I thought would make this really cool and also like um, speak to a lot of women who wanted to, you know, strive for something different and were conscious about the, you know, the consumer choices they were making. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, so that was kind of all that was coming together in about 2017 as I was starting to dream this up. That's right. That's a lot. That's a lot. Like, yeah, I know. I'm going after high quality, sustainable, you know, fabrics and manufacturing. I want to have it know where it's manufactured. I want to diverse women in my marketing and I want to have different sizes and it's got to look good and feel good. Yeah, I know. Trust me. I still to this day, I'm like, wow, that is a lot and it is a mouthful, but I think with today's accessibility to different things and, you know, being able to be more resourceful through just having, you know, the internet, for example, um, it's been a a journey for sure, but it's also been something that I think, you know, the customer really expects now, they really expect you to be able to check off those box and they're, they're interested and we've seen that demand, which is exciting. So we will continue to do what we can to, to meet that need and to also grow, you know, it's, it's, it's really exciting to me to see, especially, you know, that, you know, millennial generation really, um, you know, want that and see, you know, I'm kind of moving on from this, you know, fast fashion buying from the mall and really trying to like make purchases that are better for me, better for the environment and better, you know, for my overall just outlook on, on life in the future. Mm -hmm. You use this term fast fashion. Um, help us understand if we're not, if we're not aware of it, what is not sustainable about fast fashion? You know, it's, it's tricky because I mean, fast fashion is, um, um, you know, it's, it's very much a part of our lives and, um, it's what makes it just to, just to jump in here, fast fashion, we're talking about like new things coming out every season. We're talking about H and M we're talking about Zara, right? It's just like inexpensive made in some country by small children. Right. I know. I know. I didn't mean to laugh, but I was like, I know it's that bad. That, but that's what it is, right? It is. And you know, fast fashion is it really is the antithesis of sustainability because it really can't be. I mean, you are dealing with um these big companies that um are y- y- cutting costs in all different directions that obviously affects lives. Um, you know, there's not a lot of transparency into how things are done. 
you are dealing with um, creating styles and churning them out as quickly as possible, which means this, as soon as something hits the, the floor, you're, if it's not selling well, you discount and discount and discount until you can't anymore. And then if it doesn't sell well, you're left with all this, you know, mass production of something. What do you do with it? A lot of times it ends up in landfills. Um, you're also dealing with just the impact on the environment, you know, high levels of chemical in toxicity in the water, um, you know, it's, it's such a big a contributor to just the harmful impacts on, on land and water. So it's, it's a lot that adds up over time. And if you have a lot of companies doing that and there's not a real solution around it, you have all this backup of, of, of vast production. Like, what do we do with it? Mm-hmm. And that's scary. You know, that's just not, that's not sustainable years to come. Mm-hmm. So why why should I buy something you know at Pop Linen versus going to H and M at the mall who's got a sale and I've got this shirt for fifteen dollars you know that it'll last me a few months and then I'll move on to something else but right why, like that's really tempting like why why should I not do that like I'm not seeing the environmental impact I'm not seeing the poor small child I'm just enjoying my fifteen dollars shirt yeah totally yeah it's it's a really it's sometimes like you're, you know, we're stuck between a rock and a hard place with, you know, trying to share and express the value and educate others on what's the difference and why paying a little bit more means something. And I think in our culture, we're so used to, you know, the instant gratification of having now and just dealing with the now um, and enjoying that and not thinking of the repercussions after. So I get that. And I've been the college student that, you know, has 20 bucks what can I get with this to, to, you know, for this thing I have to be at or this dress I have to wear. So I understand that, but you know, we're just trying to, to teach like it's, it's progress, not perfection. The more we can get in front of people, the more we can share the message around the importance of sustainability and the importance of, um, you know, less is more and quality over quantity. I think we can start to have people's behavior change where they create a little more space in their lives for these kinds of products that when they see the difference and they see that this shirt's actually going to last longer because it's a better material that even when you're done with it, it's going to biodegrade. It's going to be gone. It's not going to stay on this planet forever in some weird shape or form. And also that, um, you know, we we're trying to think of the long term of this brand. So at, at, you know, we're working towards should someone buy a shirt from us and five years later, they're like, Oh, it has a hole now in the sleeve. We could be able to take that back, either mend it or, you know, give them um, a discount for further products on our site and then take that shirt and repurpose it into something different with upcycling the material. So mm-hmm. we're really trying to think of every stage uh, of this uh, product's life cycle mm-hmm. and repurpose it or make opportunities for our customers to, to not have to just rid of something when they're done. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's, it's definitely a work in progress. When I um, look through the products on your website, um, they are, uh, well, let me ask you this. Who would be the target audience for the products on your website? And how do you choose the styles that you are going to, you know, bring to market? That's a great question. Um, We've started with just really trying to hone in on like those everyday essentials that women want in their lives and, and really trying to just kind of mix a little bit of like what's happening right now, what's trending with what are pieces that are the staples that we all love that we'll continue to repurpose and use. So we really built the collection off that concept. And when we, we make everything in small batches, so, you know, anywhere from like a hundred to 200 per style. And if that does well, we'll make more of those and replenish the site. If it doesn't do well, well, luckily we didn't make too many. So we can then, you know, either sell that at a, a, some type of sale or a pop-up. And then um, we introduce new styles with the feedback we get from customers. So luckily, because of social media and just a lot of that engagement that we really try to foster with our customers, Mm -hmm. we do get real-time feedback and um, reviews, and that's great. And it helps us kind of decide what's next for us. So that's kind of how we do our collections. We really don't do this big collection, put it out there, and see how it sticks we really try to do each style and design thoughtfully and in a cadence of dropping, you know, every two weeks and every month, um, something new and see how it, re, uh, our customers react to it. All manufactured in Los Angeles. Yes. All manufactured. Not by small children. 
No, not by small children. It's actually really, really cool. We um, have great partnerships with these uh, factories. They're smaller. Um, we've been introduced by other brands that, you know, align with our values. And it's just, it's, it's a, I actually really enjoy going down there. I check in on them often, um, you know, and especially during COVID, it's great to see that our factories are practicing the social distancing. They've reduced their staffs. Everyone wears a mask, fresh air going through hand sanitizer stations and, you know, clean water. So if they're really trying to just do the right thing and not put anyone in danger, which is important to us as well. Things are a little bit more slower, but I don't mind that because obviously we're in a, you know, a really um, traumatic time. And I think it's really important that we're obviously putting the people first who are a part of our, our business and supply chain. So, you know, we're just taking it day by day. I love this uh, Rin upcycled denim open smock. And I see some yes. behind you, I believe. Is that what yeah, I'm right there? here? Yeah. Yeah. That's it. yeah so, it's pretty cool. It's just this open jacket that kind of lays out and it's made with upcycled denim. So, um, upcycled meaning it's like just leftover denim. Yeah, that's a great question. Exactly. So it's, it's denim scraps that, um, uh, the, the company we worked with kind of collected over time. They've taken those and then pulled them together and repurposed them into this new denim. So that's what we decided to do this jacket with. It's a company based out of Guatemala and they're doing all these wonderful, innovative things with, you know, old fabrics and repurposing them. Um, so you see a little bit of like this, like pulp texture to it, but it's, mm-hmm. it's really beautiful. Mm-hmm. And all the fabrics you mentioned that they're not going to be in the landfill forever. You, I've seen the list here. I can't find it on your website right now, but like yeah. list off the types of fabrics that you use. Organic cotton was the only one I recognized. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, organic cotton classic. It's, you know, it's something we like to work with a lot. Um, Tencel also is another fabric I personally really love. It's super durable. It's made from the fibers of beechwood trees and um, natural, super soft, feels really great um, and blends really well with like a cotton. Um, we use it for our sweatshirts and some of our long sleeved tops. Um, and we also use Modell, which is also another fabric that's um, made from a fiber of trees. Um, that one's really moisture wicking, super soft. So every a lot of these fabrics I choose because they're incredibly soft and they feel great. They look great and they they wash really well. Mm-hmm. So like I'm looking at a Mercedes linen long sleeve shirt on your website. It's sixty eight dollars, and you know I go wow that's probably maybe like 20 bucks more, $25 more than somebody might pay at Banana Republic or Banana Republic Mm -hmm. might be around the similar price. So your Mm -hmm. pricing is not like astronomical. We're not talking about a $150, you know, long sleeve shirt here. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's a quality linen. We've gotten, you know, great feedback on that product. Um, Again, I think, you know, doing this direct to consumer, keeping everything localized, Um, small batches, we've been, I, we've been able to make this more affordable. Mm -hmm. My whole thing is I really want to make sustainability accessible to people. Mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of times with, um, any type of company that's really promoting the organic cottons or, you know, doing things in a sustainable way, I think costs are really astronomical and in a lot of ways they have to be, I, I get that. But, um, our whole thing was I'm, I'm going to do this direct to consumer so I can really cut out those middle costs and make this more affordable. So still on the higher end, but you know, not as bad and it doesn't break the bank as much as you, you you would think it would. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of how we've been able to do that so far. Did you have a background in fashion before starting this company? Like how did this all come about? Yeah. So I definitely do not have a design background or fashion in the sense of manufacturing and production, but I did work in, um, fashion editorial in mag in magazines in New York. So I worked for Vanity Fair for a bit, Vogue in their beauty department and travel and leisure. So I got to work alongside people who, you know, really understood the fashion industry, celebrated it, um, you know, lifestyle, art, culture, all those things I was surrounded by and I really, really enjoyed and got to kind of really develop my own, you know, sense of style and taste. And in that process, um, just really started to read a lot about these companies coming up that were really trying to address the issue Mm -hmm. around the environmental impact of fashion. 
So I got really interested in it at that time and thought to myself, I don't see why more companies aren't addressing this. If it's, you know, it's such a big issue and there are, we are, we can be accessible to these different types of sustainable products. Like why can't more brands intertwine this? And that was probably like 10 years ago. And over time, you've seen a lot of brands start to really make commitments to this, which is exciting. Mm -hmm. But, um, but yeah, that was kind of my start. And then I spent the last couple of years working for two startups. One was an eyewear company called Warby Parker, direct to consumer. And the other was a men's tuxedo rental company uh, based out here in LA called The Black Tux. So at both companies, I really saw how people just started these ideas from the ground up and grew yeah. the company, scaled it. You know, uh, I saw the process of a product starting from just a sketch to being fully out there and in customers' hands. So that really excited me because I kind of got to see, wow, I mean, it's definitely intense. It's definitely a process, but it's doable. Sure, and sure. that was exciting to me. So I got to really be a part of those teams and their marketing and branding. And that really helped me with coming up with Pop Linen. Okay. So get into some of the nitty gritty of this, because we have women who are, who are listening, who are thinking about business options, you know, and you've got everything from network marketing to sell somebody's network marketing clothing to maybe start my own clothing line. Mm-hmm. Like how... How did you get started? Did you have um, your own capital? Did you have friends and family money? Did you take a loan out? Did you put it on credit card? Did you hire a designer? Did you design things yourself? Like take us through a few of those steps. Absolutely. Yeah, it is a, it's an absolute process and still to this day, I mean, all kinds of different things you're pulling out of your hat. But to start with, um, I basically started the company with some capital I had saved up. I've saved about... 10, 12 grand. Okay. Um, and that definitely was not enough, but it was, it was something to start with, you know, it was something to start dabbling with and doing some research with. And, um, in that process of kind of figuring out what it is we're going to do and what pieces we're going to make, I decided to do a Kickstarter to kind of really put Poplin on the map and get some feedback and get my initial community around the concept and Um, That was really fun. Did a fun video. We met our goal. We we tried to raise 25K and and we we got that. So that was good. We got a little bit over that, which was exciting. And that was what we were able to initially do that first small collection around and and deliver to our customers. 25 grand. I've done several, you know, Indiegogo pop, you know, Kickstarter. 25 grand is a good amount. And so did you have a lot of support from you know, people that you had worked with at Warby Parker and the Black Tux or other people, you know what I mean? Or you have a big yeah, family. It was, how did you, how yeah. did you do this? Yeah, that was a lot. I realized, wow, that is a lot of money. And halfway through, I'm like, wow, we really got to start getting out there. And it was a lot of the individuals, like family who came around, uh, of course, um, individuals from the different companies they had worked at. Mm-hmm. Um, also, random people who, who found the, the video yeah. from Kickstarter were really rooting for us and getting excited around it, which was exciting to me because I, I just really had no idea what I was doing. Sure, I was just sure, throwing sure. it out there and putting my best foot forward and um, sharing it. And a lot of friends and family um, shared that with um, their friends and it kind of just rippled effect eventually. And we did it for about a month. And so I had some time to really um, share the message and just every day I'd write 10 new people or just share about it or just say, Hey, check this out. And, mm-hmm. and it, it, it really started to, to kind of domino effect towards the end. And we, we got to our goal, which was great. Were you at your day job at the same time or had you already resigned? I had already resigned. So I was working on this at nights and weekends during my day job at the black tux. And then towards when I was st- ready to launch it, I just stopped doing that. I was like, this is the time to do it now or never kind of thing. I just had my first child, my daughter, she's four now. And, um, so I really, I knew like time was really kind of crunched for me <laughs> to yeah, say, the least. Yeah, yeah. um, but it was also exciting. I thought, you know, this is, you know, I've, I've learned a lot. I've, I've put in the work with a career and, and, and understanding kind of how things are done. And I really wanted to just give it a go. So that was that Kickstarter was super helpful. And I would really recommend to anyone who wants to do something like that to really understand it's not just that one month that you're or that couple weeks you're doing the campaign. It's all the time before that of planning it out, you know, trying, you know, focusing on the strategy of the calendar of, of creating social posts around it to spread awareness, making your list of emails of people you want to reach out to, 
even trying to get some PR around it. There's just a lot of work that goes into it. It's like a full-time job. Yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> I've done it with the, you I've, know. Done four, I've done it with four feature films. So Oh, wow. I, uh, That's I've exciting. I've done Indiegogo's and I've been involved in some client marketing projects that have done it. It is a, it's a big, it's a big deal. Yeah. yeah so it 25 is. grand may feel like eh, it's not that a lot of money in terms of like some of the big deals, but I just know how much work it takes to get 25 grand. So great job. That's amazing. Definitely. Thank yeah. you. Okay. And then you, um, did you hire a designer? Did you like, how did you find your, your manufacturing facility? Yeah. Um, you know, it was a lot of word of mouth. It was a lot of me knocking on doors, you know, Google search, but, um, you know, you go to downtown and you just walk in a lot of these different little neighborhoods, side streets, and you find, you find these factories or these little label making companies, or, you know, I did hire a production manager, like consultant for a little bit of time to kind of really help me learn the ropes with, you know, a pattern maker and the phases from, you know, making a pattern to, you know, a tech pack to having your fittings with your fit models to make sure you get the fit right. And for us, we have two fit models. We have our size um, small for our, our contemporary fit and then our size 2X for our Kirby fit. So that really helps us as the sizes extend to get the fit right across the board, mm -hmm. um, which is important to us. And um, yeah, I mean, it was just a lot of trial and error. Me going to different like textile shows, showing up, being like, I'm such a fraud here. I have no idea what I'm doing. Totally. Yep, yep. No, not my industry, but just all good. Making it, yeah, just making it happen. And for me, at my personality, it's 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 fun to do that. Obviously, it can be stressful, but it's just the way you kind of chip away and you realize, oh, this is what kind of everybody's doing when they're figuring it out, and yeah. and really learning who are are good sources for the sustainable fabrics. Were who's my good pattern maker that will get the size fit right, and you know putting our site on Shopify and that's, you know, a great platform when you're a small company and you're building out your, your design and your products. And, um, it has a whole back end that's super easy. So I would really recommend that to people who want to start up like a store or something, but mm -hmm. yeah, it just all kind of came together and I was kind of doing this just me and a couple interns. And, you know, now we have different teammates for different things. Um, still a small team, but, you know, I just try to keep things really nimble for now until it makes sense to grow. And right now, since, you know, we're all working remotely, that makes it easier with no office space or overhead like that. Gotcha. So you're 100% direct to consumer at this point. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Correct. And how do you get the word out? Is it just 100% Facebook ads? Like, what are we looking at here? How, do, how If somebody wants to start a you know how many people, especially guys, not too many girls want to do this, but it's like a t-shirt company. Oh my gosh. How many t-shirt companies, Desiree, have you seen people, you know, don't start another t-shirt company, start yeah. something like Desiree. You know, this is, this is awesome. Um, yeah. How do you get the well, word out? Um, yeah, you know, it's, it, we did some Facebook ads. Um, what I've seen with those, honestly, personal experience for where we're at, um, it doesn't make a lot of sense. You've got to put in an extensive amount of money and budget, like thousands and thousands of dollars per month yep. to really start to see, um, you know, the, your money kind of come back to you. And even then it's not really matching. So, um, but so I, you know, some people it works really well. I did that a little bit. I find, I actually found that our advocate program has worked really well for us. So we started during early spring of this year, we, we, we realized, okay, a lot of our normal, uh, revenue, channels aren't going to work. Um, we don't have our pop-ups. We don't have our craft fairs. We don't have, you know, these different partnerships in store. So we need to kind of transition, um, and really drive traffic online. So can yes. I interrupt here? You said you were doing pop-ups and craft fairs. This is brilliant. So yeah. tell me how you did this. Yeah. I honestly recommend that for small brands. Um, it's a great way to get in front of, um, people and, you know, a new consumer and get feedback in the moment. People go to these fairs really looking for these little new fun, um, brands that are popping up, whether that's in the food category or home to dec home decor or clothing. Mm -hmm. So we got our start by just setting up a booth, sharing about, you know, having our clothing there me being there, a, a, a fitting room. And, um, it was great. We would really see a lot of success. And then those customers would transition to online, which was really awesome. So 
I'd really recommend that. They're all over, but again, with COVID, they're kind of, there's not really anything happening just because sure. they do bring large amounts of people together. Did you? So, um, I don't yeah. know if you were you were probably maybe ready for unique markets. Were you guys? Did you guys sell at unique? Yeah, we did actually. We did that twice last summer, and I think one of their holiday markets. Yeah. I yeah. started a plush toy manufacturing business with little robots. And so I sold oh, cool. it um, unique like, several times, like 10 years ago. So it's oh, an incredible. Nice. Wow. And, and uh, for those of you who are listening, unique, it used to be called unique LA. Now it's called unique markets. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, the business is in a bad condition right now because oh, of yeah. there are no events, you know, and that was their right. whole business. Um, yeah. The founder's name is Sonia Rosala. Uh, yes. I think that's how you say her last name. I, I might have butchered I it. I think but. you're right. Yeah. Great uh, woman. Um, a lot of work goes into these. It's, it's oh, hard to see these yeah. companies suffering like this because they did so much for the community. Yeah. But they're, hopefully they'll come back and they're not just in LA now they're all over, but that's fun that I totally see you, you know, selling it unique. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's talk for a moment about, um, lessons because I love that. I just love your story. You don't know. I mean, you do have a background like being at Warby Parker, Warby Parker and the black tux. That's a huge, like, just, you see the vision you see like, Oh yeah, I could do this. Like this is possible. <laughs> yeah. you, this is possible. Um, yeah. frankly, I look at what you've done and go, I mean, creating the product almost seems like easier than selling it because mm-hmm. like you now have to find customers and this is like, right. That's a lot of work, money, money, money and hard work can, can help you create a line, Mm -hmm. but like, I guess money and hard work can still help you create a, you know, a a consumer base, but that's a lot of work that you're doing, you know, to create these advocates and these relationships and Mm stuff. Yeah, it's totally, I mean, you think you reached one, you overcome one milestone and then, oh, there's 20 more. Yes. And you're, you're, you're exactly right. Like I thought the hard work was creating the line, finding my people, you know, getting the working relationships down. Oh, that was the easy part. Oh, it's now it's part. Yes. Really building this brand and making it last. And especially during such uncertain times, that's been the real challenge. And, yeah. um, but I think that's, what's so important is staying really versatile staying super curious and um, just continuing to try new things and us being so small and me really running it, we're able to be agile. I think one of the, with the cool fun things we did when COVID first hit and we heard that, you know, face masks were going to be a part of life is we took all our organic cotton and we started to make masks right away. I had my sewers working from home, gave them the patterns and said, okay, let's just make a you know, couple hundred, see how they do. Mm-hmm. And we sold out immediately. And so wow. that really carried us through summer, um, just helping not only sell masks to our customers, but it brought all these new people to the site because they were Googling, you know, non-medical yeah. face masks, things like that. So um, that was really exciting. And again, just a moment of, okay, we're hitting this super big challenge. Let's not freak out. Everyone wants to freak out, but um, just trying to make it an opportunity. And I know that sounds very optimistic and super hopeful, but I think that's when you're an entrepreneur, you just have to do that to survive. Absolutely. Okay. So let's go back to the lessons. Okay. One of the lessons that maybe I, it's my lesson. It's easier to make a line than it is to sell it. Uh, That's one lesson. (laughs) That is one lesson. (laughs) Definitely always will be a lesson. Give me some other lessons. Like what? What are, what are some things that you feel like, oh man, I really learned this along the way. This was challenging. It could be very detail oriented to the industry or it could be leadership CEO oriented. What, what are some things that you think about? Yeah. I mean, one thing for sure that I think about is just, um, you really have to lead by example. It's such an important, um, you know, rule for life. I think, especially as an entrepreneur who's, who's new at this and, is starting to work with all kinds of different people. Um, you you have to put in the work too. I mean, not that not that I, I'm not wanting to, but I've noticed when you can set that example and set that bar and that expectation of for yourself, others see that and rise to the occasion with you and are and are motivated by that. And mm. you know, for me, it's it's constantly that reminder of the golden rule. Like, okay, if I want things done this way, you know, I have to be able to 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 do that myself, and I have to be able to just treat others the way I'd want to be treated in this situation. So that was a big lesson for me is just really putting in the time and the work and, 
and, you know, not being above anything and really just showing up for others who are working with me or alongside me mm-hmm. and, you know, keeping them really excited about the work and I'm um, really letting them into the big picture of why we're doing this mm-hmm. so that they can really have um, some stake in the game to it and feel a part of it. So that's a big one. Um, I also just think, you know, staying, I had briefly mentioned this before, but staying super curious um, to, to the, to everything happening around you. I think when you start to kind of grow when you see some wins, you can, you can relish in that and become comfortable. And obviously there's so much more you're going to have to overcome. And there's so many different things that will come with each phase of growth. Mm-hmm. And um, I think it's, it's just really important to, to embrace those things and to always kind of stay on your toes with, you know, how can we be improving? How can we continue to just receive feedback and, and use that to, to better the company or ourselves or our team and constantly kind of trying to foster that culture around the brand and staying true to, to why I started this. Cause I think it, it, it is easy to kind of get away from that when you, you start to feel like there's these other demands around you or the company and, um, but that's really important to me that I always, you know, stay curious, stay in the know of what's happening and how things in the world are affecting what we do and when we can speak up and, and, you know, stand up for things that are important. And, you know, when we can utilize the brand as a vehicle for good through our give back, you know, program, there's just different ways this company can be more than just selling mm-hmm. clothing. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Desiree pop yes. linen. Dot co. What the heck? What's up with Calm? How much did they want for it? How much? <laughs> I am really upset about this. How much did they so, want? I don't even know because they won't get back to us. Can you believe that? So I cannot believe that. Yeah, I tried with you know having GoDaddy reach out. I mean, full disclosure, definitely wanted it, but it was at one point this website that sold actual like linens, and then now it says it's available. So maybe I'll try again, but. We've gotten away so far with .co, but it is a little tricky for some people. Poplinen.co. And uh, I love the button in the logo. So cool. And I like that it's smaller. It's not like the full O. Yeah. How did you come up with the name Poplinen? Great question. It's actually, you know, when I was doing the Kickstarter, I finally had to have a name. People like, okay, you need a name now because we're going to put this live and it just can't be like Desiree's thing. And I'm like, true. So I just kind of was playing around with words. And the first two fabrics we worked with, still my favorite fabrics, poplin and linen. Uh-huh. And um, great, great, two great fabrics. Linen's just essential for summer. And poplin is a form of cotton that's super soft and light. And I just meshed the words and we got pop linen and it was available on Instagram. I just thought, hey, you know what? We should go with it. Uh-huh. So um, yeah, that's how I came up with it. Very cool. Poplinet.co. We'll send everybody there. That's easy to check out. And um, if they go there, there's a pop-up for what? There's a coupon or something? Did I see a coupon right now? Um, There is not a coupon, but if they use Welcome 15, they'll get 15% off on their order. So feel free to do that. Um, I thought there was a pop-up with a discount. My apologies. But if they sign up for a newsletter, they definitely get a discount. Yeah, that's That's the That's what I saw. That's what I saw. Yeah. Yep. Very cool. All right. Yep. Poplinen.co. Desiree, thank you for just sharing openly about your journey. And uh, I'm inspired. And uh, this is like a little crash <laughs> course in how to start a clothing line just in oh, yeah. 45 minutes. So super cool. Congrats. Yeah. Thank you. I, I just scratched the surface, but I'm always open to talk to anyone or help give any just feedback on my own experiences because there was a lot learned. So thank you for your time.